It's always to stand uh, here in the House of Commons and, and debate things that are of critical importance to Canadians. And certainly, having had the opportunity to serve on the Special Joint Committee on Medical Assistance in Dying, I think it's important to have that ability to, to stand here today and, and certainly allow Canadians to understand some of the difficulties that exist uh, and, and, of course, why uh, Conservatives are, uh, want to put forward a, a dissenting report, uh, which, of course, uh, is, easy, is easy for Canadians to, uh, to find. Much of the deliberations, of course, that were uh, performed in the uh, Special Joint Committee uh, related to mental disorder as the sole underlying medical condition, uh, <coughs> so-called mature minors, persons with disability, and advanced requests. And um, clearly, the plight of Canadians under the NDP Liberal government has increased the usage of MAID in this country, and I'll go on to cite several examples of that as we go through this. Uh, and I think that that's uh, absolutely incredibly important to look forward uh, to. And, and if I might, uh, just to read uh, a bit from uh, the uh, dissenting report, uh, We wish to recognize that medical assistance in dying is a complex issue and a profoundly personal issue on which reasonable people and well-intentioned people can be in disagreement. That having been said, the Canadian medical assistance in dying uh, regime represents serious problems and vulnerable persons are endangered because of the failure of the Liberal government. Whatever the point of view of each individual on medical assistance in dying, in principle, these problems cannot be ignored after nine years of poverty and, uh, and hopelessness uh, under this Liberal government, Canadians are turning to medical assistance and dying because they don't have the means to live with dignity. I say to you that that, those, that statement is incredibly important to allow Canadians to understand that as far as Conservatives are concerned, that those Canadians who are well-intentioned and well-informed are able to speak about this uh, incredibly emotionally charged topic in a very, uh, hopefully, nonpartisan way on behalf of Canadians. And certainly, uh, as a former practicing physician, these are issues that came up uh, multiple times, of course, uh, when I was back practicing medicine, and uh, medical assistance in dying is something that came about during my time in practice. When I uh, first started practicing, of course, medical assistance in dying was, was not something that was out there to be considered. And that being said, uh, you know, I certainly feel it is something that, uh, that, that perhaps I can provide some insight uh, with respect to that. And, and I think one of the other things that's really, really important for Canadians to understand is, and I know my colleague spoke a bit about this, Madam Speaker, uh, about how, can, how Canada and the Canadian regulations around MAID are perceived around the world. And uh, just to quote the American Journal of Bioethics, uh, this, the title of this particular article is, When Death Becomes Therapy, Canada's Troubling Normalization of Healthcare providing, Provider Ending of Life. And certainly it, it is a telling uh, commentary on how the regime here in Canada is perceived. And if I might just quote a bit from this report, uh, undeniably a strikingly higher number of people die with direct health care provider involvement in Canada's euthanasia regime, euphemistically termed medical assistance in dying, made than under a California-style assisted suicide system. Uh, Daryl Pullman rightly identifies several key reasons. The fact that in about all cases it involves a lethal injection by healthcare providers rather than assisted suicide with a self-administration of me medication. The law's vague and broadly interpreted access criteria, acquiescence and indifference of federal and provincial authorities, the courts and medical associations, and briefly mentioned the failure to treat ending of life as a last resort. So when we begin to think of those incredibly uh, emotional words, emotional words because they are, and, and often I wonder, 
you know, realistically, Madam Speaker, how did we get to a spot where really we are in a culture of death and we believe that the ability for simply to, to hand over our essence of life to a healthcare practitioner, how does that, how did we get there? How have we failed as a society simply to say, life is no longer worth living, just go ahead and kill me? And I think, I can remember when the debates on this first began and everybody talked about the, of course, slippery slope argument that we will never go down uh, these roads, that this will simply be for those with reasonably foreseeable natural death. And I, I think that Canadians, in their heart of hearts, because of who we are, uh, really believe that, that the expansion of MAID would never happen. And I know uh, that I, I've heard my colleagues uh, in this House today speak a lot about, well, it's, it's their right to die. Well, what about their right to live, Madam Speaker? And I think that, uh, once again, how did we ever get to the point of a country to say that part of the necessity of an incredible nation that's incredibly developed with great riches and wealth, uh, the golden age of Canada, almost, if one would use that, that term, that how did we get to the point where it's not about caring about each other, but saying, yeah, I agree with you, just go ahead and end it. Your, your life is not worth living. So as we begin to contemplate those things as a country, I do believe that it's incredibly important uh, to, to value human life and to say that it's important. Uh, are there folks out there who are suffering? Absolutely they are, and we'll, we, I certainly will come back to that. I think the other important thing before we talk about some very, very sad examples are really to talk about the state of palliative care in Canada. And uh, once again, Madam Speaker, uh, I had the opportunity as a physician to witness uh, an incredible change in how palliative care is delivered uh, where I live in Nova Scotia. And uh, <clears throat> it, was, it was absolutely uh, life-changing to have a driving force uh, behind a palliative care program uh, where I live that enabled care which historically had been delivered uh, all by family physicians uh, to a quality team of palliative care providers uh, who are able to provide a much more nuanced way for people to continue to live a life even though it's difficult. And uh, I might be so bold as to say my great friend Dr. David Henderson was the person leading that charge. Historically, uh, where I had the opportunity to work in our hospital in Truro, Nova Scotia, uh, again, th that palliative care would be provided by family physicians and realizing that many symptoms uh, during the end of life and the dying process were very difficult to control, uh, this uh, great physician, uh, Dr. Henderson, came along and was able to, to begin to educate all of us family physicians who delivered care, and not only to do that, but to make us better, better providers. Uh, as time went on, many folks uh, began to realize that either they they weren't very good at palliative care, which not everybody is good at it, if I can use that terminology. But they also began to realize that there were certain skills, uh, not just in determining which medications to give at which time, but also to, to speak to patients to understand what their goals and desires were. Exactly, uh, you know, was it that they simply wanted their pain to be alleviated or their suffering? Uh, to be alleviated at all costs, or that they want to be uh, more functional in their abilities. So those, those are incredibly important conversations to have with patients. And I would go on to say that Dr. Henderson also realized that delivering care at people's homes was also a, a, an essential part of palliative care because, of course, uh, folks often feel much better when they're able to stay in their own homes and, and have the, uh, the distressing symptoms alleviated there. And uh, Dr. Henderson was, was a great uh, advocate to say that we also need to have nurses trained in palliative care who can then be the, the extenders of, uh, of physician care 
uh, again at home or in the hospital. And certainly he has been, an, uh, as I said, a wonderful advocate for, uh, for the palliative care program in Nova Scotia and indeed across the country. The sad state of affairs is that uh, good quality palliative care, such as I've described, does not exist across the country. And I would suggest to, to colleagues here in the chamber to give that a, a, good, uh, a good thought, because I do believe that if good quality palliative care existed across the country, that perhaps some of the conversations we would be having now uh, would be quite different. I also think it important that we do understand that 7 million Canadians do not have access to primary care. And of course, that does affect the quality of care uh, overall in terms of how Canadians are able to manage symptoms of their illness and understand their illness. Because of course, in Canada, primary care is the way that we access the system. And uh, once again, uh, the demise of, of the uh, healthcare system, our much cherished healthcare system, has certainly accelerated uh, at the hands of this NDP Liberal government over the last nine years. And as I mentioned, uh, a recent report from uh, Kai Hai, which uh, lays out clearly that 5.4 million adults do not have access to primary care. Uh, which we know translates into about 7 million Canadians without uh, access to primary care, which means that they are unable to have lab work, uh, diagnostic imaging, referrals to specialists, uh, unless they are there in walk-in clinics or visiting emergency rooms, which we know then creates an entire other uh, type of problem. Those things being said, I do want to get to some examples um, about MAID in particular, uh, and there are several quotes here uh, talking about MAID in Ontario. In Ontario, more than three quarters of people euthanized when their death wasn't imminent required disability support before their death in 2023. And uh, another quote, a professor of health in the Netherlands has stated that Canada seems to be providing euthanasia for social reasons when people don't have the financial means, which would be a big taboo in Europe. And when we begin to, again, unpack those types of things, uh, a report just this morning, Madam Speaker, outlining that 40% of Atlantic Canadians have difficulty paying for the basic necessities of life. Uh, in this article, it quoted food, rent, and home heating. And that is a disturbing feature when you begin to hear what a professor in the Netherlands, and of course the Never Netherlands have had a made regime for quite some time now. The other uh, statistics we need to be aware of is it would seem that poverty is a contributing factor in Ontario's made provision. And I quote, people in the lowest material resource, end quote, category, represent 20% of the general population but they make up 28.4% of Track 2 made recipients compared to 21.5% of Track 1 recipients. Uh, so when you begin to, to understand some of these statistics, uh, as we might say, not, not to be foolish about it, but uh, Houston, we have a problem. The impact of the housing crisis seems to be a factor. Persons identified as having housing instability made up 48.3% of Track 2 made deaths in Ontario, an absolutely staggering figure. Isolation is also a definite factor in Track 2 cases. 90% uh, of Track 1 made recipients provided an immediate family member, spouse, sibling, or child as their next of kin, compared to 73% of Track 2 recipients. Those who accessed MAID via Track 2 safeguards were more likely to have provided a friend, extended family member, or other person such as a caseworker, lawyer, or healthcare provider. And as I started off my re remarks with Madam Speaker, uh, here we are in this incredible country in which we live and people are socially isolated, they're unable to afford housing uh, and access services. <coughs> The other disturbing trend, of course, Madam Speaker, is the significant increase in MAID in Canada. In 2019, there were 5,631 cases of MAID reported in Canada, accounting for 2% of all deaths. The total number of deaths marked a 26% increase over the number of MAID deaths in 2018. 
In 2020, there were 7,595 cases of MAID reported in Canada, 2.5% of all deaths, and the toll represented an increase of 34.2% from the year prior. Uh, by 2022, uh, and again, in 2019, we talked, I, I mentioned, I just have to say this one more time, 2019, 5,631 cases of MAID reported, by 2022, there were 13,241 uh, made deaths reported in Canada, according, accounting for 4.1% of all deaths nationwide. And again, year-over-year -year growth rate in, in the 30% range. The total number of medical-assisted deaths reported in Canada since the introdu introduction of the federal made legislation is 44,958 Canadians. It can therefore be projected that the number of made death, deaths as well as the share of these deaths representing in the annual death toll will increase in 2024 and may reach up to 5% of the nat national total, total of deaths. So as we begin to look at these things, this is a, a very disturbing trend. Uh, I do want to uh, quote a couple of uh, disturbing cases that I think we all need to be aware of. Uh, these are readily available in, in open source literature. Uh, Christine Gauthier, a disabled veteran and former Paralympian, was offered made by a caseworker from Veterans Affairs Canada during a phone call where she discussed her deteriorating condition. Gauthier had been seeking to get a wheelchair ramp in her house for five years. Madam Speaker, uh, as a veteran myself, this is particularly disturbing, and we know that there are other cases of veterans who called for help by Veterans Affairs uh, simply for their mental health and, of course, were offered made as part of uh, what this, these individuals at Veterans Affairs thought was appropriate in terms of offering treatment to veterans. Uh, it's, it's appalling, Madam Speaker, for folks who sign on the dotted line to serve our country, to uphold our values elsewhere, and potentially, of course, put their lives on their line, on the line, are offered death as opposed to help. Another case, uh, Normand Meunier, a former truck driver who had been paralyzed from a spinal cord injury in 2022, was forced to spend 95 hours on a stretcher after being admitted to a hospital in saint jérôme Quebec with a respiratory virus in January of 2022. This led him to develop a severe pressure sore that eventually worsened to the point where bone and muscle were exposed and visible. Uh, Mr. Mounier, in terrible pain for the ensuing two months, opted to end his life and passed away in March, of tw uh, March 29th. Again, we, we look at these stories. This is a failure of a health care system. And, and again, uh, as I quoted from uh, this report, uh, when death becomes therapy as opposed to understanding that we need a health care system that is responsive to the changes uh, that have been foisted upon us by this NDP uh, Liberal government. Madam Speaker, I, I think that it's important also in the last couple of minutes that we talk about uh, the Blue Seal program uh, for Canadians that the next Conservative government will put forward so that international medical graduates will be able to have their qualifications and experience recognized quickly as they come to this country and, and want to serve Canadians and want to have a better paycheck to be able to look after their families as well. Uh, that will be something, of course, that a Pierre Polyev government will be a able to put forward uh, as we've had multiple discussions with the stakeholders and decision makers uh, that exist both at provincial and national levels. And I think that's incredibly important that we give Canadians hope that there is help on the way and that uh, the way things are are not the way that they need to be forever. Uh, change is possible. We also know that understanding exactly uh, how this made, re made regimen works is important on behalf of Canadians. Consultation needs to be had. Uh, and we need to be able to replace, sadly, the hurt the Canadians are now experienced with hope for the future uh, so that Canadians once again uh, can be prosperous in that dream and uh, contract of being a Canadian where if you work hard that you will be able to achieve a job with a, a reasonable paycheck to put food on your table and to put a roof over your head and to live in dignity in this country and not have to worry about death being the therapy for all that ails you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank
questions and comments.